Redbox Media Programming is brought to you by... Are you looking to serve God and society? Consider putting your gifts to work as a lawyer. Ave Maria School of Law has been educating faith-filled lawyers for over 20 years. Ave Maria School of Law is committed to training lawyers to use law appropriately around the moral issues of our time. Visit AveMariaLaw.edu to learn more about integrating your faith with a law degree. Looking for a way to build daily prayer discipline? Seen the rise in mindfulness meditation, but not sure if it is possible to meditate in a way that's consistent with your Catholic faith? Just looking for a way to breathe new life into your existing prayer routine? No matter what you're looking for, Hollow is here to help. Hollow is a Catholic prayer and meditation app that helps users deepen their relationship with God through audio-guided contemplative prayer sessions. From meditations on the daily gospel to the rosary to daily examines, Hollow has something for everyone. Hollow is the number one Catholic app in the U.S. It is free to download and has permanently free content, but you can also check out all of the premium sessions for 30 days, risk-free, by signing up at www.hollow.app slash breadbox. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of Lisa Hendy and Friends. You know, often we invite um, here on the podcast authors who share their work and um, such is the case this week, but I'm particularly excited about welcoming our guests from this week because I sort of feel like I, I've i seen um, the birth of this book um, over the years that she's been working on it. Joining us today is Jessica Tomey, and Jessica is a Catholic convert, a wife, a mother, um, an author, a communication scholar, a professor, and a homeschooler. She blogs at her website website, jessicatomey.com, and she is the author of the book that we're here to discuss today, Home in the Church, Living in the Embodiment of Catholic Faith, and her research in interfaith dialogue has been published at the Journal of Communication and Religion. Jessica co-hosts the awesome podcast, um, The Catholic Reading Challenge, with her husband, Mike. Welcome to the show, Jessica. Thank you, Lisa. It is so great to be here and talk to you today. Yeah, I know. I was trying to figure out before I called you just how long ago it was that we've never met in person, I don't think, but we've been sort of online friends for quite a long time, right? Do you remember when that connection was made? Yes. Well, you actually, before we connected over this book, you did speak in Maryland at the women's group called Taste. Oh, that's right. And I'm local there, so I was at that Point going there. And so I did get to hear you then and like briefly meet you. And then I think, I don't know how, how many months after that, I reached out because I had this idea for this book and was trying to figure out what to do with it. So. Okay, well, I know for sure that that was actually before we moved to Los Angeles. So I know it's we've been yeah. friends for at least four or five years now, if not, yeah. if not longer yeah. than that. And everybody who listens is probably like Lisa's guests are always saying to her, well, I met you at XYZ place. And I have like such a terrible memory. So forgive me for not remembering oh. that exact moment. But I do know that I've long been an admirer of of your work. And I was so excited um, to hear that this book that you've really, you know, you've really put your heart into this and fought for it for quite some time. And now it's been published. And so we're blessed to talk about it today. But before we jump into talking about the book, just tell us a little bit more about um, yourself and your faith journey. Sure. I grew up in a Christian home, Christian family in sort of in the evangelical Protestant tradition. Um, Jumped around a lot, I would say, when we were young, when I was younger to a lot of different churches. So I kind of have had a broad faith, a broad Christian experience if you will, growing up. But um, my husband and I started after we got married, um, not too many years after, um, we'll be celebrating actually 15 years this month. And um, we kind of slowly became drawn to the Catholic Church. At first, we didn't really know it was the Catholic Church, but we we were we were kind of asking questions about our faith and, and eventually it led us to that place. Um, 
seven years, about seven years ago, um, we came into the church. So, um, it, and as I describe really in my book, it's, um, I had known Christ my whole life, but when I found the Catholic church, I found home in the sense that I found the home on earth that I felt was taking me to him, you know, and the home that was sort of meant to be the family here on earth, you know, walking me into his presence and, and, and then of course, ushering me into eventually eternal life with him in heaven. Um, and so that was, that was kind of my experience, but our experience together, um, even though this book is kind of told mostly sort of from my perspective, although I, I kind of tell like our story here and there, um, it really, my husband and I were really blessed to walk that journey together. And that's not always the case. I remember reading Scott and Kimberly Hahn's um, biography, Rome Sweet Home, or autobiography, I should say, Rome Sweet Home, um, kind of toward the end when we were discerning coming into the church. And it struck me as really intense that, you know, their experience of being like, I think five years apart, maybe in really coming to the same conclusion about faith in, in terms of like the Catholic versus Protestant tradition. And so I was very thankful to be sort of um, on the same page as my husband the whole way. That was a blessing. So um, pretty much our kids have basically only known. I mean, our oldest was two when we came to the church. Um, so they really have only known the Catholic church. So I would say for them, you know, it is, um, they'll be cradle Catholics, which is interesting. So it's a different perspective. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, as I have to say, I mean, I've been a fan of your writing and I've watched your blog and stuff over the last several years. But um, one thing that I was really excited about when I saw the manuscript for the book, which again is called Home in the Church, um, that while you are an academician and you are, you know, definitely a scholar, um, the book is so accessible. And I love books that um, that incorporate story. And so what we have in this book, from my perspective, is um, all these great hallmark teachings of the church, um, but through the prism of your lived experience. And so you you walk us right along with you. And um, one thing that I remember from reading in the early parts of the book is that um, while you guys were coming together, weren't you kind of maybe expecting a child around that time? And we're thinking maybe we should like yeah. hold, hold off a little bit. And then your husband was <laughs> yeah, like, so no. our second, so tell us, our, yes, tell, our, yeah. our second son Walker was, um, when we came into the church, he was only three months old. Um, so basically like three months before that is kind of when my husband was like, okay, like I'm like super pregnant. Right. And ready. Like I'm kind of just thinking about baby stuff and, you know, I mean, obviously very intensely considering Catholicism, but at the same time, sometimes we can just, everything can be about, you know, a baby when you're about to have a baby. Um, understandably so. So I was just kind of like, okay, well, you yeah, know, we'll, we'll get to that. Let's just have this baby. And he's like, no, 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 this is really, really important that we just go ahead and make this, do this now. I, I'm, he's kind of like, I'm, I'm jumping in. I'm jo I'm joining the church. I want to come to the church. Um, so, are, you know, you ready? Because I'm doing it. So I was like, okay, all right, yes. Um, obviously, <laughs> I'm not doing it without you. <laughs> It's amazing. I love that story. And the book is really um, in it. It's both your story, but it's also sort of a primer for anyone, whether they're a convert or a lifelong Catholic like me, to really know what it is that we treasure about the faith. You cover the mass, which is kind of your starting point. You cover the sacraments, domestic yeah. church, the liturgical year. Um, saints, prayer, and, you know, carrying our crosses and redemptive suffering. So how did you come up with the format for the book? And why did you decide to organize it this way? Oh, my goodness, that was the whole process um, of the Holy Spirit. It's so funny. Um, I would say usually when God puts something on your heart and gives you some work to do, he very infrequently does he give you the whole picture. I mean, I think that almost probably never happens. Maybe that's happened to someone. But it usually is like this small piece of the picture, right? Start doing this. And then gradually, I mean, ha I had no idea that um, this book was what it was when I first had the inclination of my heart to write my own story. Quite honestly, um, as I kind of, I dedicated the book to my husband and, and my kids, quite honestly, my most selfish motivation for writing this um, was because, and I guess this is the case with a lot of my writing, for my own, um, for the, my own like posterity's sake of like under of remembering, um, I think so many times, so many significant things happen to us, and it's so easy in our busy modern world to not be reflective and contemplative and and capture those um, capture those moments um, and and you know write them down and actually remember what it is that's happening. So for me, initially, 
there there was just this element of I really kind of want to tell the story for me as much as for anyone else who might be wanting to hear about it. But then I probably a few years into it after I had kind of started writing, had a couple of chapters, was kind of putting out fillers to see if anybody was, was interested in publishing. It kind of started to take a direction of being not just a straight conversion story, but like you said, of kind of bringing someone alongside and saying, here's my story, but here's kind of what it taught me. Here's what I learned about the church that you might not know, or you might want to get in deeper and, and jump in here with me, because this is this is what God showed me um, when I started investigating the church tradition and tried to investigate the church sacraments and all the wonderful things that the Catholic Church offers us. And so for me, my story started to take this shape of how did I discover these things in a way that actually made me discover embodied faith, um, which is kind of a, a concept. Uh, when I describe embodied faith to people, I'm actually working on writing a little short cor- email course for people to take on it um, right now, because I think it's sort of a form thing. We kind of think we might know what it means, but the idea of like not just thinking about our faith, but actually living it like that, that it's not just this sort of abstract thing that we know but that we know through doing, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted a book that helped. I wanted this book to be more uh, be a, a story because we learn from other people's stories so well. We're, we're storytellers, really, and as human beings. And, and we learn from other people's stories, and we, we get so much out of sharing them. But a story that propels us then to act, you know, and to um, – that, that is the whole point. Our faith is not um, dead or only mental or only existing conceptually. It's to be lived out, you know, to the fullest when John 10, 10, you know, talks about abundant life. And I, and that's what I think of when I think of embodied faith. I think of that really fully alive life that Christ wants to give us here on this earth, because it's really just, that's what we're going to be living eternally. So it's this element of really practicing here on earth, what we're meant to eternally live as eternal beings with God. You know, I'm, I was reflecting this morning as I was preparing for our conversation, as you and I record, um, which people will hear this a little bit down the line, but as you and I record, um, I'm living here in Los Angeles where just yesterday, um, after I think three weeks of being able to go to Sunday mass at church, um, mm-hmm. we again had our churches closed because of the pandemic oh. and, and threats to, you know, People's well-being yeah. caused um, places of public service, including places of worship, to again close. And uh, it sort of was like a little, almost like a little tease that we got to go for a couple of weeks. And now we're back to um, needing to really um, worship in our domestic churches. And I was thinking about how your book is almost like a book for this time for me, because um, what mm. I've what I've found in the last um, what feels like an eternity since we've been able to be regular at church is um, needing to go to all of the hallmarks of my faith um, to live it um, in such a trying time and under such trying circumstances when we can't, most of us can't physically receive the Eucharist at this time. And so I was really thinking about how it was really wonderful that you handed me like this bouquet of a reminder of, you know, what it is that we love about our church. Were were there any of the things that you wrote that have been helpful to you and your family during this time of difference um, in practicing our faith? You know, I think one of the most primary ones that came to mind just immediately as you asked that question was really understanding the the mass. Um, it's funny as being deprived of something, kind of like you say, you really, you really tend to, you, you sit and think, right? It causes you to sit and think and consider how, what a gift it is. But I think there are a lot of, there were a lot of Catholics in America who didn't, not only maybe we didn't appreciate um, the gift and the access that we had to the Eucharist and the Mass and, and to, the, to the prayer of the Mass itself. But I think perhaps there are a lot of people who didn't really know um, why it's so powerful. And when we had the opportunity to step back and realize um, it's not just about this moment of receiving God as like you'd receive a power pill or something, right? It's actually this opportunity, which is not being taken away from us, to enter into this, this prayer, or this sacrifice, and to to get, to offer yourself on the altar with with the offerings and that we enter in with Christ and sacrifice our life along with in that prayer to the father and 
I think that has been a powerful reflection um, during this crazy time in our world. Um, that's been a really powerful, powerful reflection. And to really consider uh, what that means, I, I always tell people like that these things, um, the sacraments, these things of our faith are the most real. And so many times in the modern world, it's like this veils pulled down over them so that what we think is reality, what is the most real to us is totally not. And really the supernatural is actually the most real, touchable, tangible thing. We just don't have eyes to see what's there. Like this, um, there's like this veil that just like needs to be pulled over our back, over our heads through the arms of faith. Um, and I think that sometimes these types of moments in our world can be that arm reaching that veil back to help us see how real these things are and how even they can't really be deprived. We can't really be deprived of them. They can't really be taken away from us in truth. Um, that God is so close to us. And even in, especially in times like this, he is right there. You know, the presence of the loving father is right there with us. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And one of my favorite chapters um, in the book was the one that you wrote on domestic church. And I'm wondering kind of, um, you know, if you can kind of encapsulate that a little bit in helping people to have a sense of how your family has um, well lived your domestic church. Well, we have, uh, it has looked very different over the years to give people a perspective <laughs> right now. <laughs> Right now we have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old. And when we first became Catholic, we just had the two older boys um, who were two and three months. All right. So, you know, we had some time to kind of figure out, hey, what it, the beauty of that was we had some time there having a really young family to kind of determine what things were important to emphasize. Um but essentially, and so while it's looked different over the years, and, and it does, it changes, and you grow, and that is not meant to be this. I want to just say to people who kind of, there's so much out there about the domestic church, and there, there often is this, this concept of, oh my gosh, we have to do this perfectly. And this, this becomes this performance idol thing that sh it's not at all meant to be. It's meant to be this life <laughs> Thank you. Yes. This, <laughs> yes, this life-giving um, avenue of God's grace, where we just bring the church into our homes and we live it out in a domestic way so that it's not, I mean, that, that actual, that actual act is, in, is embodiment itself, right? Of the spiritual life. It's not, it's this rejection of, um, of this like duality of the spiritual and the secular of like, this is Sunday, this is church time. And then this is other lifetime. It's just this seamless, organic, continual um, presence of God that you're acknowledging in your home and when you go out of your home. And I think that that truly is what the domestic church is meant to be. We're just authentically living this with our family and we do a good job and we do a poor job, but we're, we're um, you know, trying our best to bring our faith into every moment of life. And so that very much means that our, our family life, our domestic church really should be alive with all these same aspects of our faith and that there's not like a pause button that we hit. So that looks different. You know, that looks different in different spaces of time. And right now we truly struggle with um, like getting a whole rosary said with four little kids. Like it, it never seems to be that everybody's like on the same page. Right. It's just, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a hard time of life, but then, um, but then there are other things that are very beautiful that, you know, happen organically. And there are little things that we have um, just naturally taken the time to put the effort in to, to make, you know, a priority. Um, and, and then we did see fruit from that. One of the one example I would point to that I love is that we have a, a two volume book set of like um, sort of a, a kid, not really kids. I would say junior, um, like young adults, um, but it's kind of perfect for all ages, Lives of the Saints. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, they're really short. They're just like one or two pages. And we just read it every day. And this, usually during the school year, since we homeschooled sometime in, in the morning during, you know, um, in, in, there's a break in our in our school day that we'll, we'll read about the saint of the day. But during the summer, it's been at lunchtime. And so that, that's a pause button of just like both living the liturgical year, like celebrating that life of that saint, that, that eternal <laughs> intercession that's continually going on even that person even though that person hasn't been living for centuries like the idea that we're 
we're, we're telling that person's story because we have so much to learn from that person. But we also, at the same time, are asking that saint's intercession, this person who's been dead for centuries, we're asking that person to pray for us. And it's a powerful um, ritual to believe in and to, and to take part in acting out. And like to actually live that moment means all of those things, right? To children and to you. And so like doing those kinds of things together and, and determining over what things do we want to emphasize, what things are important and how do we, how do we live this out in family life? Um, those can be really significant moments. And that's like, you know, five minutes. Um, so it's not like really having a strong, beautiful um, expression of the domestic church, which will look different in every family. It's not like that needs to be a really complicated thing. Yeah, I love yeah. that. And I, I think you referenced that one of the great parts of the book is that at the end of every chapter, you include some resources that will help you oh, to yeah. live out those. And I think you referenced that, um, that two volume set um, in that. Well, sadly, we're coming up to the end of our time together. I want to remind everyone um, that the name of this book um, by Jessica Tomey, which actually her last name, you you can look at your phone and see it as you're listening to this, P-T-O-M-E-Y. Um, the, the name of the book that we've been discussing, Home in the Church, um, Living an Embodied Faith. And Jessica, are there any kind of closing thoughts that you'd like to share before we let you um, get back to family and, and your work? Yeah, I um, I think that this might be just, you know, for those listening out there, many of you might be Catholics and you might be someone who um, will certainly benefit from, I know I I love I love conversion stories, so I could really never read too many of them. And, and it's very hard for me. I have to be very careful when I start one because um, if I have other responsibilities, I might tend to like not put the book down. So that has been a pro- problem for me. So I'm sure that all of you would benefit from the story, but I think, um, and get a lot out of this book, but I think it's also, I've had feedback from friends who, who read it, who said, you know, this is really a great book for people who were part of the church or who are seeking to someone, it really is like, is I think appropriate for people in all stages of asking, you know, what is it that the church is offering us and how can it be a home for me? And my hope as I wrote it was that it would be accessible to people in all walks of life, that it wouldn't sound like I was just speaking to a closed off audience, um, that it's just me sharing, sharing a journey that I think other people sharing about a faith that I think other people, even if it's not their faith currently, would be really interested in investigating. So I just say that to say it might be a, might be a story that blesses you, but it also might be a book that um, you, you read and you think, oh my gosh, there's someone who I feel like this just connects with. And I think that's the reason we have so many different kinds of stories and so many different types of, of books like this, of people telling their story of coming to faith, because every person's story can connect with a different person because there's just some amount of shared experience. It's powerful. And when we encounter someone who seems like they've walked a path similar to our own, it becomes a very powerful testimony to read their story and how, how they've encountered faith. And sometimes it can be, um, yeah, it can just be sort of the balm that's needed on a wound maybe that that's been there and that someone didn't know. So my prayer is that, um, that it might be that for some people out there who are who are asking, you know, how the church could be a home for them. That is so beautiful, and and it's also a reminder that we all know people in our lives who um, who may never come into the church, but who love and and want to, to you know want to know us more deeply. And so this is a book to yeah. share with those friends as well. Why we do the things that we do is such a great thing. Jessica, so so grateful for um, your work on this book for. Um, all that you do, but especially for the gift of your friendship and for the heart that you share. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. God bless. God bless you. Well, that is it for this week's episode. Definitely know that um, our show notes will include a link to jessicatomey.com as well as to the podcast link for the Catholic Reading Challenge, which is the podcast that Jessica co-hosts with her husband, Mike, and definitely want to check that out too. And um, you can find all of that through my website, lisahendy.com, where we include um, links to all of our previous episodes and information about the guests that we have here on the show. So grateful for you for being a listener to this podcast, grateful for your feedback and just your prayers and all of your well wishes. Um, Please know that you're in my heart. I hope you have an awesome week. God bless.
Finding someone on an online Catholic dating site shouldn't be like shopping for a blender. So why do most dating sites leave you feeling like you're shopping for a spouse? At Catholic Singles, we connect members through our unique user polls and activities, which help you discover other members and their personalities and interests. Because you're a person, not a profile picture. So stop shopping and start discerning. Trust your love story to the original Catholic dating site and use the promo code BREADBOX at checkout for 20% off at catholicsingles.com.